Hi, welcome again. I'm Dr. John Milkenny, and this is Chapter 2 entitled Cardiovascular Physiology. So, um, know that you're all very energized having gone through Chapter 1 and are now masters of respiratory physiology and the uh, relationship between intrathoracic pressure or pleural pressure and thoracic volume. Uh, and now you're ready to uh, move on to chapter two. I've been tracking the number of views of my lectures online and I'm happy to announce that in the last week the views of chapter one has increased 600 percent. Some of you may challenge that and say that an increase from one view to six views is not really clinically significant and that when five of those views are your mom, that that may be a bit of an inflation, but I think we're moving in the right, right direction in terms of heartlung.org, and I think that chapter two is going to impress you just as much or more as chapter one. So we talked about pressure in the respiratory system in chapter one, it's pretty analogous in the circulatory system. Um, there's different kinds of pressure, and uh, this chapter is going to focus on the dynamic and static pressures of the circulatory system, just like we talked about the dynamic and static pressures of the respiratory system. And the dynamic pressure of the circulatory system uh, drives blood flow, just like gas flow in the respiratory system. And the relationship between this pressure and flow is known as resistance. So we're going to talk about that as well. And the static pressure of the circulatory system is responsible for vascular or ventricular volume. Just as in the respiratory system, it, uh, it was a determinant of, of thoracic volume. So this, a lot of this should be a review uh, for you if you've gone through Chapter 1. And the relationship between... Um, the static pressure or the transmural pressure of the circulatory system and, uh, and volume, vascular volume or ventricular volume is known as compliance. So this is my idealized blood vessel, the perfect non-distensible uh, tin pipe that we use to model the circulatory system, which as I'm sure all you appreciate, the circulatory system is almost nothing like that. So the dynamic pressure generates a flow, in this case it's blood flow, so there's an upstream pressure, a downstream pressure, and then this uh, drives a flow, and the relationship between um, pressure and flow here is resistance. Similarly, the static pressure determines a volume, and the static pressure of the cardiovascular system is known as the transmural pressure, and it relates to volume by compliance. And as you can see here, the pressure in this upstream portion of the vessel is actually greater, and so the transmural pressure of this arrow is a little bit greater than the pressure down here because you lose some of this pressure um, uh, with the resistance to flow. So in, in effect, actually, the pressure um, in the proximal portion of a, of a blood vessel is actually, the transmural pressure actually tends to be greater. And as a result, instead of being this perfect um, non-distensible, unchanging ves uh, uh, vessel of unchanging caliber. Blood vessels actually don't really behave like this at all. They, tend, they can actually be tapered where the uh, upstream pressure, the radius of the vessel is actually greater than the downstream pressure. And as you can appreciate, that the greater radius upstream than a downstream will actually result in greater flows upstream because as the resistance incre or as the radius increase the resistance decreases. And so the pressure flow relationship in the blood vessels just as it was in the respiratory system is actually not quite linear and that is um, to be discussed. So with that out of the way I want to begin this um, this chapter, chapter 2 with uh, venous return. This chapter, like chapter one, will be broken down into various parts. This chapter will have three parts. The first portion of this chapter will talk about venous return, both from the systemic vascular bed and the pulmonary vascular bed. Um, part two, or part B of this chapter, will deal with uh, cardiac function, um, cardiac function curves. And then part three, or part C of this chapter, will deal with 
um, integration of vascular physiology, venous return, and cardiac physiology, so an integrated cardiovascular physiology and a graphical representation thereof, as many of you may know as the Guyton analysis, and also an integrated um, graphical analysis of heart-lung interaction, which uh, I will introduce to you in the very end of this lecture in the third part. So systemic venous return. Venous return is very important. It's, it's half of it's the vascular physiology of cardiovascular physiology, really. Uh, we live in a very cardiocentric world, and we often think of the cardiovascular system only in terms of the Frank Starling mechanism. But if you think of it only in terms of the Frank Starling me mechanism and not as well um, in terms of venous return, you're, you're really missing half of the picture. So over time, venous return equals the blood ejected from the heart. That is, inflow is equal to outflow. And so they may be considered equivalent. Venous return and cardiac output uh, is a flow in liters per minute. And much like airflow in the lungs, pressure and flow are plotted, can be plotted against each other. And uh, this relationship is the resistance. But in order to understand venous return, you have to understand both the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. Because like anything where there's flow, you need an upstream pressure and a downstream, downstream pressure, i.e. a pressure differential. Just like in weather, you need for wind outside, you need a high pressure and a low pressure. Uh, and this is typically represented on a graph, which we'll see here. So this is your venous return curve. On the y-axis, you have blood flow in liters per minute. And on the x-axis, you have pressure. And this is, unlike the Campbell diagram, this is a vascular pressure, which we historically measure in millimeters of mercury. And we're going to really get into the nitty-gritty of this, of this curve because it's important to understand um, cardiovascular physiology, venous return. So the right atrial pressure is the most commonly assessed pressure, both invasively and non-invasively, of the circulatory system. As I'm sure you all know who have been in the ICU, we, we put in uh, um, a right IJ or a left IJ or a subclavian line. That is a central line into the superior vena cava, and we measure the central venous pressure, which is essentially exactly equivalent to your right atrial pressure, barring any wild caval anatomic abnormalities. So you've just absolutely got to understand how the right atrial pressure is determined, and it's frightening how many people do not fully understand the physiology of the right atrial pressure. Uh, and even more frightening when people do not understand the physiology of the right atrial pressure, and then they use the right atrial pressure um, to drive management decisions, which frankly can be harmful at times. The right atrial pressure is the downstream pressure for venous return, as I've said, and um, as right atrial pressure is therefore decreased, then venous return will increase, and that makes sense because if it's the downstream pressure and you lower it, you're widening that pressure differential, and therefore flow will increase. And from this, you can generate a slope, uh, or sorry, a curve. And this curve, which we'll talk about, the venous return curve, um, here is defined in terms of the upstream pressure, the mean systemic pressure, the downstream pressure, which here is the independent variable, what we're, what we're altering, the right atrial pressure. And then the dependent variable on the y-axis is the venous return, and that is your flow, or your venous return back to the right heart. So I've mentioned this a little bit already, but it's determined by these three variables. The mean systemic filling pressure, as we'll talk about, is actually this point here on the x-axis. The right atrial pressure is, um, is also on the x-axis, and the resistance to venous return will um, be depicted as changes in slope of this graph. So you can see that venous return will increase if the right atrial uh, pressure decreases. So comparing um, this right atrial pressure, you get this amount of venous return. To this lower right atrial pressure, you get a greater venous return and therefore greater blood flow um, to the heart. Um, venous return will increase with a decrease in resistance to venous return for the same right atrial pressure. So this uh, slope here, or this curve here, is a graphical representation of a decreased uh, resistance to venous return. The mean systemic filling pressure is the same, 
but the slope of the line has changed. So you can compare these same right atrial pressures here and here, but actually the cardiac output, or rather I should say the venous return, return flow to the heart, is actually greater for this slope, which is a, represents a decreased resistance to venous return. So I've been talking about this mean systemic filling pressure. This is the mean systemic filling pressure, um, and this can be changed as well, and this will shift the curve rightwards and leftwards. So this here represents an increased mean systemic filling pressure. And you can see for the same right atrial pressure, you have a greater, comparing this to this, you have a greater venous return here compared to here, similarly up here. Okay, that's represented by that green arrow. So all this talk about the mean systemic pressure, what is the mean systemic pressure? Well, it was that x-intercept that we just saw. And this is the pressure in the vasculature when the venous return, that is the cardiac output, is zero. So if you remember from that slide, um, the, just the previous slide, the x-intercept is the definition of when the y-intercept is zero. So the y-intercept was, or y-axis is zero, y-axis is blood flow. So when blood flow is zero, if I were to arrest the circulation, make everything stop and let all of the pressures throughout the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, you know, venules, veins, all four chambers of the heart of arrested circulation, everything comes to an equilibration. You, and then you measure the right atrial pressure. Well, the right atrial pressure is going to equal this mean systemic filling pressure. And then if I were to restart the heart, jump start it, give it a little bit of electrical shock, then the heart starts moving blood from the venous system to the arterial system. These, um, you know, stroke volume cardiac output starts being transferred to the arterial system. Then um, right atrial pressure is lowered and venous return increases, but the mean systemic pressure stays just about the same as when the um, circulation is arrested, and that's because the venous capacitance beds are large, and 70% of your blood at any one time is in the venous capacitance bed, so you kind of have to think of it as like a, as a big swimming pool where there's so much volume and so much compliance there that whether flow is arrested or then flow begins again as the result of cardiac function, the pressure in the um, venous capacitance beds is essentially the same. Um, and the mean systemic pressure, this um, abbreviated, unfortunately, PMS, is essentially determined by two variables, and it's, uh, again, the compliance equation and that is um, compliance equals the change in volume over the change in pressure. So you can rearrange that and you then get um, essentially the change in pressure equals the change in volume over compliance. But the volume is the stressed volume and the vascular compliance, not just any volume, it's the stressed volume. So in the, you know, the increase in mean systemic pressure that occurs in response to a given change in stress volume is the static pressure and derived from the compliance equation, which is what I just said. It's this um, rearrangement of this equation. It's the stressed volume over the venous compliance, and this equals this x-intercept, or the upstream pressure to venous return. This is, this is uh, a crucial um, physiological phenomenon to understand if you want to understand venous return and right atrial pressure. So what's this, you know, stress versus unstressed volume? I just said that the, the numerator of the mean systemic uh, filling pressure um, is determined by the stressed volume. Well, you can think of the stress volume when you're thinking about blowing up a balloon. There's, if you're blowing up a balloon or a beach ball or whatever, this, you have to add a certain amount of volume with essentially no change in pressure or stretch on the, on the wall of the beach ball or the balloon. And this is your unstressed volume. And so this is your kind of flattened vein. And if you increase volume on the x-axis, pressure on the y-axis, if you increase volume from here to here, you have very little, if any, change in pressure. And that's just sort of filling up the vessel, filling up the balloon. But then you get to a certain volume here, essentially, and pr pressure then begins to rise. Um, and this is the stressed volume. So now you've started to tense the walls of this um, vein 
and uh, the pressure on in the walls is going up, and the pressure in the vessel is going up. And therefore, if you want, so that the total volume of this vein is always equal to the stress volume and the unstressed volume, and you can kind of shift, um, you can shift this around a little bit. So if you want to increase the stressed volume, you can either increase the total volume in the veins, sort of like giving a fluid bolus, and that would be increasing the total volume here. So you've increased the stress volume, say, from here to here. And the, pr and the pressure has therefore gone up. Your mean systemic pressure has therefore gone up. Or you can decrease the fraction of the unstressed volume. So follow this, um, this cartoon carefully and keep your eye on this point here, on this volume here. If you were to then change the characteristics of this blood vessel, you've now kept the volume the same, but you've decreased the fraction of the unstressed volume. Now the unstressed volume only lies here to here. Um, so therefore, any additional volume above this uh, changed unstressed volume is now stressed volume. And this will therefore increase your stressed volume and increase your mean systemic pressure. <clears throat> now, I commonly get this question, well, what's the difference between capacitance? You know, you'll read these physiology papers and you'll read capacitance and compliance and capacitance, and, and what really is the difference? Well. Capacitance refers to a total volume for a total pressure or a total pressure for a total volume. And it's, um, that's distinct from compliance, although they're somewhat similar. Compliance refer is, a, is more of a dynamic thing. It's, it's the change in volume for a change in pressure. Compliance is really uh, a derivative um, and refers to the, the slope of the curve, whereas um, capacitance just is a total pressure for a total volume. So you can see here that the compliance really of this curve compared to this curve has changed because the slope is dynamically changing. The change in volume for a change in pressure is dynamically changing. But if you were to consider this blood vessel, well the, I've tried to draw it so the slopes at all points are essentially the same. So really the compliance, if you take the derivative of this curve at, at any point, you essentially get the same value. But you can see here that the capacitance for this is lower. So for this volume, you have this pressure. But for this same volume in this vascular bed, the pressure is much higher. So this has a lower capacitance, although its compliance may actually be quite the same. So it's a subtle but important distinction. So as I just said, you can increase the mean systemic pressure by either increasing the total volume, decreasing the unstressed volume fraction, or decreasing the vascular compliance. Um, this results in an increase in the upstream pressure and therefore uh, a greater venous return for any right atrial pressure. Conversely, a decrease in blood volume, an increase in the unstressed volume, or in the uh, vascular compliance um, will shift the venous return curve to the left in a parallel fashion. And I'm going to illustrate all of this in a moment. This is a lot of words, I apologize. But this right shift in the venous return curve um, I'll refer to in my written volume as well as in these lectures, you may hear me say an increase in circuit function while a left shift in the venous return curve I'll refer to as a decreased circuit function. And I'm using these terms, essentially I'm stealing them from Sheldon Magder, um, but it's an, an analogy to cardiac function. You'll, when we, in part two of this we'll talk about an increase in cardiac function or a decrease in cardiac function. Well, you can make the same um, analogy with uh, uh, the circuit function, an increase or a decrease in circuit function. So back to the venous return curve, this is the mean systemic pressure that we just spent all that time talking about indicated here. So this is an increase in your mean systemic filling pressure, so we've either increased the stressed volume, decreased the compliance, and therefore shifted this upstream pressure rightward. So now you can see that this is what I've referred to as an increased circuit function, that is for any given right atrial pressure, venous return will be greater. And common causes for this is volume expansion. So if I fill you up with liters of crystalloid, um, you'll shift the curve rightward. But also adrenergic stimulus that um, decreases the unstressed volume of the veins like ad or adrenergic agents. So this is actually a response to hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, you'll try and shift your cur curve rightwards as a response to adrenergic tone. 
Whereas the opposite is a, is a decreased circuit function, and this is a parallel leftward shift in the Venus return curve. So you've decreased the pressure head for Venus return, you've decreased the stress volume, or you've increased the compliance of the Venus beds. And therefore, at any given right atrial pressure, say we'll just take three for example, here you have less Venus return than here, and less than this curve here. So this refers to, a, or I've, I'll refer to this as a decreased circuit function and common causes is volume loss, sedatives, adrenergic agents. So you'll see patients who are about to get intubated, you know, you slug them with a bunch of sedation, <coughs> and you actually uh, decrease their mean systemic pressure, um, and then you, with the initiation of positive intrathoracic, intrathoracic pressure, then you actually tend to increase the right atrial pressure, and these things tend to co-conspire to having low venous return and therefore low cardiac output. So s you can see that circuit function, in quotes, depends on multiple variables, uh, including the mean systemic pressure, which itself is determined by multiple vari variables, and the resistance to venous return. And I'll talk about this in, in later chapters, but really your volume status, how hyper, hypo, or euvolemic you are, is really the numerator here. So you can see that plays one role in your mean systemic pressure, which then plays one role in your venous return and therefore your right atrial pressure. So using right atrial pressure, you can already glean from these curves, using right atrial pressure as a surrogate for volume status is fraught with problems. So on the venous return curve, um, there's this phenomenon known as maximal venous return that's very important. And as you saw in those previous curves, there's kind of a plateau which tends to occur in the spontaneously breathing patient at around atmospheric pressure or zero. And the mechanism for this, this is very important to understand, is when the um, vascular pressure, the, uh, the pressure within the IVC, or the SVC for that matter, drops below its ambient pressure. Um, and this results in a collapsing effect of these vessels. Um, and so when you're taking a deep breath in, you're actually lowering your uh, pressure within your IVC. You're actually raising intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and when right atrial pressure drops below this intra-abdominal pressure, the IVC collapses. And you can see this fluttering effect, which you've probably witnessed on an ultrasound of the IVC. But when this phenomenon occurs, flow doesn't stop as the IVC kind of collapses on itself. Instantaneously, the pressure head then supersedes um, the pressure within the blood vessel and flow instantaneously begins again. So this fluttering effect just causes a plateau or, or a flow limiting effect. It doesn't stop flow. And this collapsing paradigm is, is known as a Starling resistor and the phenomenon of maximal flow independent of downstream pressure is known as vascular waterfall which you may read about in physiology texts. And I'd like to illustrate that here with this hokey little cartoon here. So if you picture this, this is a patient lying on their back. This is posterior and anterior. This orange is the diaphragm. This is the heart. And um, these blue lines are the, you think of it as the thoracic cage. So right atrial pressure. Um, this area here would be your abdominal pressure, PAB, and this is arrow here, this is your IVC leading into your heart. So when you inspire, when you lower your intrathoracic pressure, it's that lowered intrathoracic pressure, as we'll discuss later in this chapter, and also extensively in chapter 6 on the central venous pressure. The lowered intrathoracic pressure is, is transmitted to the right atrium, and you get this pressure gradient that drops down the IVC, and concomitantly, the abdominal pressure is increasing as the diaphragm descent, is contracts and des, des, descends, and intra-abdominal volume decreases. So you get blood flow, and then you get this phenomenon of collapse. And this is occurring as the abdominal pressure is superseding the IVC pressure, and it's causing this maximal, this plateau effect. And this is essentially maximal venous return. But importantly, as you saw in the previous slides, that if you increase your circuit function, as illustrated by this rightward shift of your venous return curve, not only does it re result in an increased venous return for every any given downstream pressure, but it also increases the absolute value of maximal venous return. 
And this becomes important as we discuss the, the relationship between cardiac function and venous function because this uh, plateauing of venous return essentially sets a break limit on cardiac output. So if, if you lower right atrial pressure, um, you know, below atmospheric pressure, and you hit this plateau in your venous return curve, this prevents cardiac output from, from increasing beyond that point. The heart can only pump out what it receives in return. So a decrease in circuit function or a shift in your mean systemic pressure to the left equivalently lowers maximal venous return. So I talked a little bit about this already, capacitance versus compliance. The capacitance is a, a term used to describe the relationship between total volume in, uh, of a vascular bed and total pressure in the vascular bed. Um, and the capacitance um, appropriately takes into consideration both the stressed and unstressed volumes discussed earlier, whereas compliance is a, is a change in volume and a change in pressure. The capacitance of a vascular bed may change as a result uh, uh, of changes in compliance of the vessels and that would be an intrinsic cause. Or the capacitance of a vascular bed can um, change as a, as a result of an extrinsic cause. And so changes in ambient pressure um, can actually change the cap capacitance of your vascular bed. And a decrease in the vascular capacitance tends to improve in your circuit function that is shift the venous return curve rightwards. Um, in effect, you know, decreasing your uh, vascular capacitance is somewhat like decreasing the compliance in that it shifts the venous return curve rightwards. Um, and why I'm talking about this is because as you increase intra-abdominal pressure as occurs with normal inspiration or really with you know, mechanical ventilation for that matter, um, abdominal pressure goes up and this tends to decrease intra-abdominal intra-abdominal vascular capacitance, and that actually tends to shift the venous return curve rightwards. So here, oops, sorry, got a little ahead of myself there. This is an introduction for ab abdominal circulatory interaction, so if you increase your abdominal pressure, descent of the diaphragm with inspiration or other causes like that would, you know, of, in of intra-abdominal um, hypertension tends to shift the curve rightwards. So it tends to shift your mean systemic pressure rightwards so you have a greater pressure head um, driving venous return back to the heart. But as we saw, the increased intra-abdominal pressure tends to collapse the IVC and lower maximal venous return, effectively increasing the resistance to, re to venous return. So you, the diaphragm descends, the abdomen is pressurized, you have a shift in the effective shift in your mean systemic pressure. But with that collapse, you may actually effectively increase the resistance to venous return, which, which drops the slope and therefore lowers your maximal venous return. So, so what exactly happens when you um, inspire? And the predominant effect is actually determined by the underlying volume status of the patient. This was work that was done, I believe, by Takata and colleagues in the mid-90s. And they applied the idea of west zones, west zone one, two, three, in the lungs to actually the abdomen. And they found that if the patient was volume replete, which is essentially like analogous to um, West Zone 3 physiology, um, and abdominal pressure increased, then there's actually an increase in, in venous return, an increase in IVC flow, an increase in maximal venous return. Whereas if the patient was more volume deplete, i.e. their abdominal vascular beds were, were predominated by West, so-called West Zone 2 physiology, then you, then you had a, a predominance of this increase in venous resistance effect, and therefore um, venous return was actually um, blunted in these patients who are hypovolemic. And I think that intuitively makes a little bit of sense. Similarly, for adrenergic medications, um, this is just furthering the discussion on, on determinants of, of venous return, um, adrenergic uh, medications have an effect on um, vascular capacitance as well. And as you can imagine, uh, giving adrenergic medications tends to shift the curve, the venous return curve rightwards. But there's some interesting pharmacological properties of um, 
and this has to do with expression of receptors in various vascular beds. Selective alpha stimulation tends to increase the resistance to venous return, and there's some thought that this, this primarily occurs in hepatic uh, venous beds, whereas beta stimulation tends to uh, decrease the resistance to venous return and therefore shift the slope of the curve up and to the right. So the body's endogenous adrenergic response, therefore, when you release catechols and they, they, they then act on beta and alpha receptors, would tend to facilitate more of this response where you have an increase in your pressure head, an increase in your mean systemic pressure. You've recruited, um, you've recruited unstressed volume into stress volume. But at the same time, stimulation of the beta receptors tends to um, decrease the resistance to venous return, which would facilitate this curve. Whereas solitary alpha adrenergic stimulation, which you may get pharmacologically with, say, neosinephrine, may have more of a detrimental effect on limiting venous return by increasing the resistance. And that's what I've mentioned here. And um, a lot of this literature is uh, reported on by Sheldon Magder in his um, studies on uh, venous return in sepsis and septic shock and how the pharmacology of septic, sepsis and septic shock uh, can be a, um, uh, applied to patients who uh, have, have, severe, have severe SERS response. And what about volume depletion? So volume depletion, as we've already talked about, shifts the venous return curve leftwards as a drop in mean systemic pressure. Uh, and, but when your volume deplete, you then have an adrenergic response, and this tends to recruit unstressed volume and can compensate somewhat for this volume loss by um, shifting the curve back rightwards. And I think, again, this is some of Magder's work where you can, in a 70 kilogram man, just um, by adrenergic stimulation, you can recruit about two liters. Um, it's sort of like an auto bolus, and that's just from your adrenergic response. Um, but, you know, as you may have witnessed as well, in these patients who are living on their adrenergic tone, so to, so to speak, when you then give them sedatives or anti-adrenergic agents, you can completely blunt this effect or reverse this effect, and then these patients just, just plummet very quickly. So now, uh, just to wrap up this first part, we talked about uh, systemic venous return. I'm now going to turn to the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary venous return, and the physiology is really quite similar. Um, you know, the, essentially identical, an identical curve can be created, um, but the x-axis instead of right atrial pressure now is left atrial pressure. And like systemic venous return, the pulmonary venous return curve is shifted um, to the right when quote-unquote mean systemic pressure increases um, and in a manner similar to intra-abdominal pressure and really actually it's, it's kind of the reverse. This, this pulmonary venous return physiology was actually known prior to the abdominal venous return or the systemic venous return physiology um, that I presented to you in the last slide. This, this, um, this work in pulmonary venous return, I believe it came out of the Hopkins lab, I think in the 70s. I want to say it was Ro Robotham's work in conjunction with Saul Permutt, but this return to the left heart was actually known, and then uh, the Takata came along, I believe, in the 90s and applied it to systemic venous return in the abdo uh, abdominal bed. So again here now we have left atrial pressure, pulmonary venous return. This is venous return moving through the pulmonary veins. So an increase in transpulmonary pressure, which, as we saw in Chapter 1, results in an increase in lung volume in a manner similar to an increase in abdominal pressure, shifts the um, pulmonary venous return curve rightwards as the pulmonary venous capacitance beds, uh, pulmonary venous capacitance is decreased. But increased transpulmonary pressure tends to collapse the pulmonary veins. Um, and lower maximal venous return. So this would be, tend to be West Zone 2, true West Zone 2 physiology because we're speaking about the lungs here, West Zone 1, West Zone 2. So that would tend to increase the resistance to pulmonary venous return. And just like in the abdomen, as Takata showed, um, in the abdomen, 
uh, the predominant effect is determined by the underlying volume status of the patient. So if the patient is volume replete or hyper hypervolemic pulmonary um, venous pressure is much higher. This is West Zone 3 physiology. Um, the pulmonary venous pressure is much higher than the transpulmonary pressure. So increasing lung volume tends to decrease the capacitance of these beds and sort of squeeze blood into the pulmonary veins and therefore into the left atrium. But if a patient has volume deplete and pulmonary venous pressure, the, pre the pressure in the pulmonary veins is much lower than the transpulmonary pressure, which again, the transpulmonary pressure is your alveolar pressure less your pleural pressure, which, which is what determines volume, uh, increase in volume of the lungs. Then um, lung, the increase in lung volume or the increase in transpulmonary pressure tends to impair venous return and you have more of this increased resistance effect seen here. So here's my, here's my really cool cartoon that I spent a very long time making. And this is the last slide of part one of venous return of chapter two, part A of chapter two, however I'm going to label it. So this is West Zone 1 physiology, this is West Zone 2. West Zone 1, essentially, the alveolar pressure supersedes pulmonary arterial or capil capillary and pulmonary venous pressure, whereas in West Zone 2, the alveolar pressure supersedes pulmonary venous pressure. And in West Zone 3, pulmonary arterial pressure, pulmonary capillary pressure, and pulmonary venous pressure um, is all greater than the alveolar pressure or the transpulmonary pressure. So what happens here is with an increase in your transpulmonary pressure or lung volume, uh, watch these little resistors here and watch these arrows which represent blood flow here. The increase in lung volume tends to compress these vessels and therefore impair venous return. And you tend to get this increased resistance effect, lowering of your maximal pulmonary venous return curve from zone one and zone two physiology. But um, with uh, an increase in transpulmonary pressure from zone three physiology. So keep your eye on this arrow down here. If you increase transpulmonary pressure on this guy, you actually kind of squeeze this pulmonary vein and you squeeze blood out through the pulmonary vein and you tend to get this pulmonary vein, uh, pulmonary venous return curve. And so you actually augment pulmonary venous return in patients uh, with West Zone 3 physiology as you increase transpulmonary pressure or lung volume. So that's it for part A. I hope that you understand everything about venous return now and that it's determined by the pressure head, and which is your mean systemic pressure, and the pressure sink, which is your right atrial pressure or your left atrial pressure, depending on which circuit you're talking about. And it's also determined by uh, the resistance to venous return, which affects the slope of the curve. And now that you understand venous return physiology, we are ready to move forward to cardiac physiology coming up.